We're, we're back to our study in 1 Corinthians um, uh, chapter 4. We're going to look at the first nine verses. And uh, I did um, uh, uh, come out of my seat a little bit when Danny was our guest speaker uh, a few weeks ago. There are 66 books in the Bible and, and many chapters, uh, but he happened to teach on the one chapter that I'm teaching on today. <laughs> so I was like, oh, gee, <laughs> I guess I should have mentioned that to him. That's exactly where I am. Uh, but I, I've done the same thing to someone else before. And uh, since, the, since that occasion as a guest speaker, and I, I taught the message the guy was going to be teaching the next week, I, I try to make sure, where are you at <laughs> in the Bible right now? And uh, I'll try to miss that, uh, that one section, but uh, nonetheless, uh, we'll go through and, uh, and certainly introduce the thought of this idea of being a, a steward or a household manager over the mysteries of God. That's our, our theme and our, and our title. Uh, I wanted to, uh, baseball season's uh, uh, beginning, to start with a little uh, illustration here, and there's a picture of uh, Alan Rodriguez. Uh, a lot of you may not know who he is, but uh, 2001... Uh, he was awarded uh, uh, the biggest contract in the history of professional sports. Uh, he was at the top of his game, uh, on his way to the Hall of Fame. Uh, according to some sports writers, he could uh, outcatch, throw, at, out hit uh, any other baseball player on a baseball diamond anywhere in the world. Uh, but apparently, it wasn't enough for him because he went ahead and took uh, uh, steroids anyway to become better, uh, even though he was already the, the, the best, which of course. Uh, was eventually found out through testing and has created lots of problems for him and his career and uh, how he'll be looked upon uh, as a baseball player. Uh, a columnist for the New York Times, uh, David Brooks, wrote this, and I, I thought it was interesting. It uh, applies a little bit to our, uh, our message here and in terms of this idea of being a steward. God's all given us certain things and trusted time, talents, uh, and treasures, we'd say, uh, but also we're going to see the mysteries of God that we're entrusted with as well. It's a matter of what do we do with them and do we acknowledge that. Uh, but uh, David Brooks writes this uh, about uh, Alex Rodriguez. Uh, self-preoccupied people have trouble seeing that their talents come from outside themselves and can only be developed when directed towards something else outside themselves. Enclosed in self, they come to believe that their talents come from self and are for themselves, locked in a cycle of insecurity and self-validation. Their talents are never enough, and they end up devouring what they've been given. And certainly that would be uh, applicable, uh, as David Brooks says here, to Alex Rodriguez. Uh, preoccupation with self, believing that uh, abilities and, and giftings that you have have come from self, and they were never given to you from an outside source. Therefore, your focus remains self-centered, uh, and no matter how talented or gifted you are, no matter what uh, comes your way in terms of what we call the blessings of God, it's never enough, and you end up devouring the very gifts that God has, has given you. Uh, and certainly that's a concern here, uh, as the theme continues and will for our next message as well, all the way to the end of chapter 4, the first section in the letter of these problems that Paul is uh, dealing with, the divisions uh, in the church. Look at verse 6. He says uh, that none of you may be puffed up on behalf of one uh, against the other. That's the problem, this pride, this uh, arrogance being lifted up. I'm of Apollos, I'm of Paul, I'm of Peter, uh, and, uh, and so forth. It was uh, creating quite, quite the problems here. Again, we're, we're still in this first section. Uh, division is rooted in pride. Paul's tried to remind them of the, the cross of Christ, uh, of their own testimony. Not many of you were noble, not many mighty, and so forth. Uh, look at what God has done for you in terms of your salvation. Uh, it speaks of their testimonies. He's talked about their future rewards in heaven. We'll touch upon that again uh, here as well. Uh, and, and again, Paul is, is uh, making a case Rather than just give them the big exhortation, stop it, <laughs> he actually is making a logical and a reasonable case why they should turn from their pride uh, in, in the division uh, among them. It has to do with their past in terms of the grace of God and what uh, God is doing, uh, has done for them. It has to do with their future and the fact that they'll stand before the beam of seat of Christ or the judgment seat of Christ one day. Now he includes this idea of the mysteries of God uh, and being stewards of them. I'm going to read our whole text, and then we'll go back and break it down. 
And we're actually uh, going through the first eight verses here uh, of chapter 4 of 1 Corinthians. Paul writing, Let a man so consider us as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required in stewards that one be found faithful. But with me, it is a very small thing that I should be judged by you or by a human court. In fact, I don't even judge myself. For I know nothing against myself, yet I am not justified by this. But he who judges me is the Lord. Therefore, judge nothing before the time, until the Lord comes, who will bring both, both bring to light the hidden things of darkness and reveal the counsels of the heart. And then each one's praise uh, will come from God. Now these things, brethren, I have figuratively transferred to myself and Apollos for your sake, I'm making the application, Paul's saying, that you may learn in us not to think beyond what is written, that none of you may be puffed up on behalf of one against the other. For who makes you differ from another? And what do you have that you did not receive? Now, if you did re- indeed receive it, why do you boast as if you had not received it? You are already full. You are already rich. Uh, you have reigned as kings without us. And indeed, I could wish you did reign that we also might reign with you. Those last couple of verses are considered the most sarcastic verses in the Bible in terms of Paul exhorting them. You guys are kings already? Awesome, maybe I could be a king with you. You think you're so great is the idea. So again, a little exhortation, but the reasoning uh, he begins is this idea of the position of the steward and uh, the fact that uh, uh, he is the household manager, the position of the steward. That's in verse 1. Let a man so consider us as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. As uh, Danny mentioned, again, <clears throat> the, um, the emphasis here uh, is on the, uh, a couple of things. One is that uh, idea of a servant. Uh, Paul uh, uses a term here, servants, literally translated under rowers. Uh, those would be the uh, those on a Roman ship uh, that are down below, if you've seen any of those Ben Hur ben, ben movies, the guys in the bottom of the boat, and they're rowing down there, and the guy's cracking the whip. That's the term that Paul uses. Us, us guys that you are dividing over, me, Peter, Apollos, uh, we're the under rowers, we're the, we're the servants. Uh, as, uh, as God's stewards, that's the attitude that we're to have to see ourselves as servants. Uh, and so his question is, is one slave really greater than another uh, down here in the bottom of the ship? I, I don't think so. And of course, uh, this is the example of Christ uh, to us. Uh, we're all servants, uh, in a sense. We're all preachers, whether you like it or not. <laughs> Most of the sermons you give are by your life and not so much with your words, but we're all out there. We're preaching something uh, to, to those around us. Uh, An attitude makes a huge difference. We're all uh, stewards uh, in terms of the household of Christ, which, uh, again, leads to explanation. Secondly, the position of the steward is a household manager. And, uh, and uh, this is the person that, uh, well, if you're into Downton Abbey, it's the butler, right? I mean, everybody stands when he enters the room. He runs the household. If you're not in Downton Abbey, I'm sorry. He's, uh, anyway, he's the guy that runs the whole show. He owns nothing. He owns nothing, but he actually is the manager of everything. It doesn't belong to him. He's been appointed the manager, the household manager, on behalf of someone else, the, uh, the actual owner, the master, the, uh, the Lord. Joseph was the steward uh, in the house of Potiphar, uh, for, for example. Uh, and the idea here is uh, uh, the need for, for somebody who is dependable, somebody that is faithful. God is, calls all of us to be household managers, to be stewards. Uh, and uh, whether we receive that role or recognize that role or not, that's what he calls us to do. Uh, it's a matter of how dependable we, uh, we are. We have, uh, uh, we have another Mark Souza with us this morning that's usually here on Wednesday night. Mark is the golf director at uh, Midpac, but... Uh, uh, at one time, uh, our worship leader was the uh, golf director out at Kapolei Golf Course, Sofa. And uh, Sofa was, is a large person of Polynesian ancestry that can hit a golf ball very far. Uh, and he played on the Asian Tour, the PGA Asian Tour, for a number of years. And uh, just a wonderful guy. And he, um, he was uh, taking a break from the tour, uh, and he filled in for a guy uh, over in Kapolei, uh, over there, one of, the, uh, one of the country clubs there. Uh, but he was, uh, was uh, going to be gone for a couple, three weeks, so he filled in for him. And while he was there, one of the things that uh, these guys do uh, is give lessons and so forth. So he played with a, 
a guy from, uh, from Japan, gave him some, some lessons and played with him a couple of times. And uh, as he would try to do, he would try to work his testimony <laughs> in, into the conversation and share about his faith uh, in Jesus Christ and, uh, and so forth and got to know this guy a little bit and they played together uh, two or three times over the course of a couple of weeks and so if, uh, finished that, that little time there, went back and play, playing the tour. So he's a touring pro, uh, but he gets a call then from this guy who is ready to build now his golf course in Japan, the Kapolei Golf Course. And he says, would you come back and would you be my director of golf at the golf course? And Sofa said, well, I, that's not really what I do. I'm a tour player. I don't know anything about managing golf courses. And uh, it's apples and oranges. He says, well, I don't really care about that. I just know because your testimony of Jesus Christ and what you said to me, I can trust you. And that's what I need. I'm in Japan. I need to know there's somebody there that is trustworthy. So you, you can learn everything else about uh, where to plant the trees and not to plant the trees and uh, what kind of pesticides the guys are supposed to use. You can figure that out, but I need somebody there I can trust. And, and that's the job that he did for, for many years. Uh, people are looking for somebody who can manage and be trustworthy. And God is expecting all of us uh, to be that kind of a household manager, which leads to, uh, again, uh, the third idea of this position of being a steward. It's we're responsible of the mysteries uh, of God. Uh, and again, that word mystery uh, means something that was not known that is now known. And we've uh, looked at that, uh, that many times. Uh, and there, there are many. Uh, in terms of the mysteries of God, I, in my handwritten notes, I had about uh, 10 or so, and I've uh, s- I spared you a little, but I trimmed it down to five. But just to give you an, uh, an idea of the mysteries of God, what has God entrusted to us uh, that we're to be faithful with? Now, in the previous message in chapter 3, because we stood at the being the seat of Christ, the emphasis there in terms of being faithful was, again, time, talent, and treasures. But here, the emphasis is not on that. We're supposed to be faithful in that. But it's very specific in terms of, that's what it says, the mysteries of God. Uh, We're a household manager, stewards of the mysteries of God. Uh, So these are some of them. The the mysteries of the kingdom are are mentioned in the Gospels, uh, in every one. Jesus tells lots of Uh, lots of parables about, uh, and there was a steward or a household manager, and his master left on a long journey, and and he tells a a parable. Uh, And so the parable is about the kingdom, uh, and they're they're about being alert, they're about being faithful, uh, and many other things. There's a mystery of the blindness of Israel in regards to the Messiah. Paul says in Romans 11, 25, I do not desire, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery lest you should be wise in your own opinion that blindness in part, in part, has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. How, how have we done with this one? The mystery, something we didn't know before about Israel. You and I know from the Bible that in the end, Israel is going to be saved. Uh, we know that in the end, Israel as a nation Uh, persecuted by the Antichrist uh, by the end of that seven-year period known as the time of Jacob's trouble or the Great Tribulation, they will cry out in fulfillment of the prophecies uh, and recognize Jesus as their Messiah. How's the church done with? Well, the church hasn't done well with that mystery at all. This is a mystery, something that we know that God entrusted to us. We haven't done very well with it historically, uh, as uh, as you know. Uh, In fact, we've, we've we've done terrible with it. Uh, and uh, it's, one, it's one of the uh, reasons I, uh, we had somebody come in and visit for uh, another occasion, and they, they saw the menorah up here, and uh, he's, uh, the guy said to me, uh, um, I-, I thought you guys were Christians. Uh, no, we are. Yeah, we're, it's a non-denominational church. Uh, isn't, isn't that a Jewish thing up there? Well, Christianity is kind of a Jewish thing. I don't know if you really thought about that. That's the menorah, like in the temple. Jesus is the light of the world. That's what he was talking about. You know, we got Jewish prophets, a Jewish Bible, a Jewish... It's pretty Jewish, you know. Uh, but it, it was interesting. I had another guy uh, of, a, of another background uh, that said that he was a Christian. When our offices were upstairs, that wasn't sure he would come into the office because there was a menorah there, because it was a Jewish thing. These are people that are Christians, uh, we haven't done very good with that mystery, for example. But God says, I've entrusted you with some information here. How Are you going to be faithful with it or not? Are you dependable? Uh, three, we're, we understand the, uh, the mystery of the rapture of the church. 1 Corinthians 15, 51. 
some believers will not die. They'll, they'll be raptured, uh, caught up together with the Lord uh, to be with him uh, forever. That was a mystery not understood before that you and I understand. We understand the mystery of the church, that it's Jews and it's uh, Gentiles together. Again, uh, one of these issues that have been tried to uh, be covered up since the time of, of Constantine. And I've done a little, uh, a little more than uh, a little, uh, ri- I've done quite a bit of reading on it. And, uh, and there was already anti-Semitism building in the early church by 150 AD. But by the time Constantine uh, allegedly comes to, uh, to faith in Christ uh, in the 4th century, then you have an all-out assault uh, against Jews within the church. Uh, you have a changing of holidays. And t- up until that time, th- the church celebrated Passover. Uh, and Paul's going to mention that uh, in his letter to, uh, uh, to the Corinthians. Uh, they celebrated other Jewish feasts because there were so many Jewish people in the church, and it spoke of Christ and his coming and his deliverance and so forth. And so uh, they had to then interject uh, other holidays that they derived from pagan backgrounds, Yes, Christmas and Easter. They interjected those into the church calendar in order to remove the Jewish holiday to try, in a sense, to obliterate uh, the Jewishness of, of the church. And it certainly, uh, certainly continued. Uh, the mystery of the Antichrist, 2 Thessalonians 2, 7. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Uh, only he who now restrains uh, will do so until he is taken out of the way, and then the lawless one will be revealed. We know about the Antichrist. Uh, we know that he's coming. Uh, we know that he may be around right right now uh, as we watch everything being positioned in the Middle East, whether it's uh, Putin and uh, his move into the Middle East uh, and uh, all the things that uh, we see happening in Europe uh, a call for a, a, a common currency, a cashless society, all of these things. We're quite aware of that. It's, it's something that a lot of people don't know, but we're aware of. It was a mystery, but it's known now. Six, I told you I was going to give you five. One more. The deity of Christ and the gospel itself is a mystery. First Timothy 3.16. And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit seen by angels, preached among the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up in glory. A little uh, encapsulation of uh, of the ministry of Jesus Christ, his divinity, he's God, come into the flesh uh, and died for the sins of the world. The gospel itself, the deity of Christ are are both mysteries. And of course, we could go on. So God says uh, to us, through Paul's letter here, that we're all household managers. We're stewards of something. Certainly our time, talents, and treasures. But more than that is some very important information and we could go on. You can do a search of mystery in the New Testament and read uh, the many things that were not known before, but they're known now and they're known by, uh, by you and I. How are we doing with that information? Uh, are we sharing it with others? Are we faithful? Are we, uh, are we dependable? That's the position of the steward. We've already mentioned it, but uh, it needs to be said again. The second point is the priority of faithfulness. That's in verse 2. Moreover, it is required in stewards that one be found faithful. Faithful. Again, a steward doesn't uh, live to please himself or even the members of the household uh, or even the other servants. Uh, He lives to please uh, his uh, his master. Uh, Again, the main issue here is uh, uh, have... uh, Paul and Apollos and Peter, have they been faithful to do the work that God's entrusted to them? Uh, Yes, they have. Uh, I mentioned before that this idea of a household manager is mentioned several times in the gospel. Uh, Jesus mentions it in Luke uh, 12, 41, for example. Uh, There, uh, again, Luke writing, then Peter said to him, Lord, do you speak this parable only to us or, or to all people? And the Lord said, who then is that faithful and wise steward? That's our word whom his master will make ruler over his household to give them their portion of food in due season. Blessed is that servant, that household manager, whom his master will find so doing when he comes. And uh, this whole parable is about being alert to the second coming of Jesus Christ, uh, to be faithful. Are we faithful uh, in these things, the mysteries of God? In this case, uh, being alert to the return uh, of Jesus Christ. Are we, are we like the, the wicked and the lazy household manager that says the master has delayed his coming? Or are we faithful? It's been said that God is not looking for great success. He's looking for faithfulness. 
Uh, and certainly that's what we see in the parable of the talents. Again, uh, there's uh, three people who are household managers who have been trusted with something. The Lord returns later to see how they've done. His words to those that were faithful, enter now my good and faithful servant. It's the same idea. It's been said that dependability is the greatest ability. You know, you can have a lot of abilities, but if you're not dependable, uh, it's, you know, you're just not useful uh, to, uh, to a business, a corporation, a job, whatever it might be, uh, and perhaps even to the Lord. Paul says uh, it was this idea of faithfulness uh, is the reason why God even called him, him into the ministry. 1 Timothy 1, t- uh, 12, Paul says, And I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who has enabled me because he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. The writer of Proverbs expresses it this way, Many a man, man uh, claims to have unfailing love, but a faithful man who can find. It's a rhetorical question. Can we even, can we even find one? And uh, if, you've <laughs> if you uh, are... Uh, uh, you, you may have uh, people, thoughts going through your mind now, the people that you know that are not very <laughs> dependable or not very faithful, and the, uh, and the ones that are, are. But the question is, uh, are we being faithful of the mysteries uh, of God? The position of the servant is uh, all about the, the attitude of serving, uh, the priority of, of being faithful. It means being dependable. Uh, three, uh, then it leads to the praise that we're looking for. There's uh, praise at the end of this, and we'll see it comes directly uh, directly from God. All of us are going to stand before the beam, the seat of, of Christ. Uh, Paul's already described the, uh, the idea that whatever we've done for the Lord, it's going to be tested by fire. Uh, some things are, are like precious stone, silver, and gold. They're going to endure. Other things are like wood, hands, double. They're going to be consumed. Uh, but in the end, uh, he says, you'll, you'll escape as, as through the fire. And uh, uh, there's something else very beautiful here at the end of verse 6 in regards to this. Paul says, in regards to the praise we're looking for in verse 3, but with me it is a very small thing that I should be judged by you or by human court. In fact, I don't even judge myself, or I, I know of nothing against myself, yet I am not justified by this, but he who judges me is the Lord. Therefore, judge nothing before the time until the Lord comes, who will both bring to light the hidden things of darkness and reveal the counsels of the heart, then each one's praise will come from God. Uh, Now these things, brethren, I figuratively transfer to myself and Apollos for your sake, that you may learn in us not to think beyond what is written, that none of you may be puffed up on behalf of one against the other. So uh, there's three three courts in mind in terms of a judgment. Uh, We're saying that the praise will come at the judgment. There's three courts or, uh, or three judgments that Paul has in mind. The first court is what we would call the lower court. It's the court of the opinion of others. That's in verse 3. But with me, it is a very small thing that I should be uh, judged by you. Uh, J.B. Phillips in his transliteration says, uh, but as a matter of fact, it matters very little to me what you or any man thinks of me. Now, uh, Paul Paul wasn't callous to people's opinions. Uh, He did care what people thought about him. Uh, And he's going to deal with uh, uh, all of the terrible things said about him in the second letter to this particular church uh, be- because of that. He's not immune uh, to uh, the expression of others and what they say about him. He does defend his apostleship uh, in that letter with great, great passion. Uh, he is sensitive to what other people say about him, but he's not directed by it. Uh, he's not, his life is not directed by the opinions of others. Well, you should be doing this. Well, you should be doing this. You shouldn't do it that way. You should do it this way. Listen, there's wisdom in the counsel of many, and there's uh, certainly a validity for that. Uh, But we want God to be leading us. One day, you and I will not stand before our friends and neighbors and be judged. We're only going to stand before Jesus Christ. It's his opinion that we should care the most about. This is an opinion, uh, but Paul, I don't think sarcastically here, is saying that... uh, I just have to do what the Lord is leading me to do, uh, even if it's not popular uh, at the time. Abraham Lincoln once said, public opinion in this country is everything. And uh, wow, if it was in his day, it certainly is uh, in our day as, uh, as well. This uh, quote I read uh, that I came across by Horace Greeley, uh, he, he wrote for the, uh, the New York Tribune, was the editor, one of the great supporters of Abraham Lincoln when he, uh, when he ran for uh, his presidency, just kind of put this in a little historical context, uh, but uh, this is certainly very applicable today. 
He wrote that uh, fame is a vapor, popularity an accident, riches take wings. Those who cheer today will curse tomorrow. Only one thing endures, character. Uh, and that's, that's the idea here. Someone else said, the trouble with most of us is that we'd rather be ruined by praise than saved by criticism. <laughs> uh, you know, opinion is one thing, uh, and it's fine. Uh, to have your critics uh, may be useful, uh, but it's not the thing that guided and directed uh, the life of Paul. It should not be us either. The first court, the lower court, is the opinion of others. The second court is a higher court. Uh, it's the court of our own conscience. That's in verse uh, 3 in the second half. He says, in fact, I do not even judge myself. Uh, conscience uh, is not always the best, <laughs> the best safe guide. In fact, the Bible says that uh, our hearts are deceitfully wicked. Who can even know them? Uh, now, we do have a, we come to faith in Christ, we have kind of a sanctified conscience, and God can speak to us and direct our conscience. Uh, we can be disobedient to the Lord and sear our conscience. Uh, a conscience is not a, uh, not a bad thing. Uh, it's been said that an honest man will not be guided by the opinion of others, but he will do uh, what he thinks is right. But that's not even always right. <laughs> we really need to hear from the Lord. Uh, there's a lot of people doing terrible things around the world today that feel very good about uh, what they're doing because according to their conscience, uh, they're quite just, justified in, uh, in doing it. I read uh, in uh, Os Guinness's book, uh, The Suicide of a Free People, uh, he was uh, talking about the uh, different aspects of freedom, and he had a, a funny little quote by Benjamin Franklin. And uh, Benjamin Franklin says that, uh, that uh, democracy uh, is... Uh, Two wolves and a lamb having a vote on what's for lunch. That's democracy. But liberty uh, is, uh, is a lamb that is uh, well fortified with weapons. <laughs> uh, you, you, you need both. You need democracy and you need liberty. Uh, both is, uh, is the idea. Uh, there's, a, there's a lot of people that, uh, that, uh, that have freedom uh, around the world is his point, but they've, they've ruined it. Uh, because they they believed what they did according to their own conscience was uh, was justified. Uh, there's a war going on in Syria right now, and uh, almost 300,000 people have died, uh, and everybody is doing what they believe their conscience is guiding them to do over there. Uh, it's not always the, the best thing. Again, J.B. Phillips uh, says of uh, uh, Paul's uh, here uh, in verse 4, I don't even value my uh, the opinion of myself. Uh, that doesn't justify me before God. Uh, it's good to have a conscience. Uh, we hope that our conscience is informed through Scripture uh, and can be sanctified. Uh, but at the same time, uh, that's not the thing that should be directing my life. I'm not going to stand before my own conscience one day and be judged. The third court, the Supreme Court that we must stand before, uh, is the Lord. Second half of verse 4, but he who judges me is the Lord. So uh, again, this is the Bema Seed of Christ that we've spent some time talking about. And of course, uh, what uh, our sin is not judged there because our sin has been separated as far as the east is from the west. Uh, God remembers it uh, no more. It's been covered by the blood of Jesus Christ. It has nothing to do with the Bema Seed of Christ and Christians. The only thing that's going to be judged there is whether we've been good household managers, good stewards or not, with our time, talent, and treasures. Uh, and here also, apparently, uh, with how we've handled uh, the mysteries uh, of, uh, of God. Uh, and so that's what uh, Paul is concerned about. That's what we should be concerned about uh, as well. A final evaluation when we stand before Jesus Christ. Then the true facts will be revealed, even the motivation for everything that, uh, that I've done. Uh, that will lead, secondly, to the praise will come at the proper judgment. Of course, there's a wrong time for judgment. He says that in verse 5, therefore judge nothing before the time. Uh, and the judging here is the judging of one another. They were doing it. It was causing division. I'm of Paul. I'm of Apollos. Well, I'm judging you because of this. I'm judging you because of that. Listen, uh, there are things that we can judge. Uh, we're told to judge according to Jesus in terms of uh, the, is something a sin or not according to the Bible. Uh, there's lots of things we're to have discernment uh, about actively. Uh, but we, we, we have no idea the motivation of why somebody uh, does what they do. Uh, we really can't judge the motivation uh, of another's heart, uh, and that's what uh, is being spoken about here. Uh, Samuel writing in 1 Samuel 16, 7, 
classically says, uh, man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. Only the Lord can do that, so don't judge before the time. Secondly, there's a right and wrong standard for judgment in verse 6. Now these things, brethren, I have figure, figuratively transferred to myself and Apollos for your sake, that you may learn in us not to think beyond what is written. And certainly the, uh, the uh, believers in Corinth were, were, uh, were going beyond what was written in terms of uh, how, they, uh, how they viewed one another, how they disagreed with one another. They weren't being guided or directed by Scripture. Uh, even how they looked in terms of uh, leadership and so forth, uh, they weren't being directed by Scripture. Uh, leadership is pretty clear. We have all the qualifications of 1 Timothy 3 as well as, uh, as, well as, as Titus. Titus. I, uh, again, I have... Somebody that I've been uh, communicating with that was uh, uh, applying actually to uh, become a pastor of a church on the mainland, uh, and one of the first things they had to do, they had to answer a questionnaire uh, of over 200 questions. Uh, and uh, I was tempted to ask him to send it to me. I wanted to see what, what, they, what they were asking to see if they went beyond what was written, because uh, there, there's some very, very specific things uh, that, uh, uh, that are there in the, in the Word, and that's what Paul says here. There's a right and a wrong standard. There's a wrong time and there's a wrong standard for judgment. But again, the judgment involves motive, as we said. That's in verse 6. That none of you may be puffed up on behalf of one uh, against the other. Their motive was not spiritual. They were promoting division uh, in the church, uh, and, uh, and it was causing problems. Pride was uh, the root of the issue. But even in that, at this judgment, we see the praise in the end will come from the Lord. That's in verse 5 in the second half there, that each one's praise will come from God. I think we can all take comfort in this. <laughs> it's, it's, uh, I don't know if you've ever, ever met someone that, uh, that you, can, uh, you can hardly get them to say a bad thing about somebody. I don't know if you know who Bob Fitz is, but he's a worship leader with YWAM and travels uh, you know, most, of the, most of the non-Western world in terms of ministry, but uh, uh, <laughs> we got to know him about 30 years ago and so forth, and he's a good friend. Uh, of Danny Lehman as well, and uh, and uh, and I, I said to Danny one time, "Have you ever heard Bob say anything bad about anybody?" And Danny and I said, "No, I've even tried to get him to say something bad about somebody. I can't get him to say anything. Uh, he won't even agree with me if I say something bad about someone. It's terrible, you know." Uh, but that's the idea. Uh, we're all going to stand before the Lord one day. Uh, whatever we've done in this life, whether we've been faithful or not, it seems like in the end. God's going to figure out something good to say about us. <laughs> God's going to give us praise whether we probably really, de really deserve it or not, just, just by His grace. Uh, and you see that reflected a little bit uh, in the book of Revelation where uh, you have all these churches that, that maybe have done some, some bad things, but yet I commend you for this. Uh, there, there's only one church that He doesn't do that because it probably wasn't a church anyway. It was so bad. But all the others, even though they've kind of blown at some others, it's like, but, you know, I still commend you for this. He finds something good to say about us. He's going to find something good to say about you. I just find that very, uh, very encouraging. That's why I say that's the praise where uh, we should be looking for. But lastly, the problem is that of, of arrogance. For who makes you differ from another? And what did you have that you did not receive? Now, if you did receive it, why do you boast as if you had not received it? You are already full. You are already rich. You have reigned as kings without us. And indeed, I could wish you did reign that we also might reign with you. So again, the, the problem here is a lack of dependence upon the Lord. Who makes you different, verse 7, from another? What did you have that you did not receive? Again, Alex Rodriguez was a very talented uh, athlete uh, in our opening illustration. Uh, he was very gifted uh, anybody that's uh, seen him play baseball uh, would, uh, would say that. Uh, but as far as he's concerned, uh, it's something he developed on his own, not something that he received. Uh, and that's, that's a problem. Uh, what do we really have that we did not receive? Yeah, well, I may have received you know, some talent, but you, know, you have no idea how hard I've worked. Or really, that, I would call that perseverance. That's right, that's perseverance. Who do you think gave you the ability to persevere? You know, you just go on. It's all, it's all from the Lord, Paul is saying. 
The idea that the slaves are, are, are trying to outbrag one another is ridiculous. And we're just down the bottom of the boat trying to get the thing to move along before the guy cracks the whip again. You know, it's, it, it's, it's not about that. It's just whether we're dependable or not, whether we're faithful or not, anything we've got. Uh, we need to be uh, people that are dependent upon the Lord. Who makes you different from another? Probably the best commentary on verse 7 is the witness of John the Baptist, who says in John 3, 27, uh, John answered and said, A man can receive nothing unless it's been given to him from heaven. And then he later says, that's why in verse 30, he must increase, but I must decrease. That's why he says that. Hey, anything I've got is from the Lord anyway. And uh, that's, it's certainly, uh, this is pretty basic. We, we've we've got we've to come, come to this point where we recognize that everything we have, every good thing, uh, as we learned in James, every uh, every good gift has come from uh, the Father uh, in heaven. Uh, and then lastly, the problem of arrogance, again, is that we've said the root cause of the division. And um, Paul uses some uh, sarcasm here uh, basically to say that there's no room for pride when it comes to being a servant of God. <clears throat> he could say in the vernacular, it's, it's time to get off your high horse. And Paul knew something about that because he got knocked off a donkey himself. That's how he, uh, he uh, came to the Lord. We're all stewards of our time, our talent, and treasures, and also the mysteries of God. I don't know if you've ever even thought about that. Uh, these wonderful things that, yeah, I just went through six of them. There's, it's a pretty incredible things that we know that you didn't know before. Paul actually takes a, a, a term here that's very familiar in, in the Greek religious world. There were the mystery religions. And in the mystery religions, and that's the word he uses here, mysterios, we just, it's a Greek word we say in English, and it comes out mystery. Uh, and in those mystery religions, there were the secret uh, things about the religion that no one knew unless you were initiated into it. Then you were told the secrets of that particular religion. And Paul says, we've been initiated in Jesus Christ. Uh, we've come into fellowship with him. We're part of the church. And because of that, now we know the secrets. Uh, and there, there are many of them. The gospel itself, being saved by grace, the deity of Jesus Christ. We know what's going to happen in the future. We know the Antichrist is coming. We understand the truth about uh, Israel and the church and, uh, and, uh, and how God is still uh, dealing with, uh, with his people in, uh, in Israel. And, uh, and so many things that we know that are mysteries that other people do, don't seem to comprehend or, uh, or understand. Uh, he's made us household managers of all of these truths. Just to close with one more quote by a man named Murray Harris, again, about this idea of two aspects of stewardship. It says, all too often we regard stewardship simply as a matter of giving to God, but this aspect is secondary. Before we can give, we must possess, and before we possess, we must receive. Therefore, stewardship is, in the first place, receiving God's good and bounteous gifts. And once received, those gifts are not to be used solely for our own good. They must also be used for the benefit of others and ultimately for the glory of God, the giver. The steward needs an open hand to receive from God and then an active hand to give to God and to others. Everything, everything we've got is, we've, you have to receive it, and then you give it, uh, is, uh, is the idea. Uh, and we hope that uh, in the end, uh, we hear the words of Jesus, well done, good and faithful, steward, household manager. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. Uh, in the end, we'll be for it, the beam of seat of Christ. Whatever happens between now and then, God's going to figure out something good to say about us. And I'm kind of thankful for that. But we hope it's, 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 it's more. We hope it's not hard for him to come up with something. <laughs> How's that? Let's give him a break. <laughs> Let's make his day and try to be faithful servants. Amen? Let's pray. Lord, we thank you that um, we can consider the, all that you've given us, that not just in terms of uh, families and friends and uh, gifts, uh, natural abilities and talents uh, uh, that we may or may not have uh, developed, Lord. Uh, we often uh, give thanks before the offering just for the ability to work and, uh, and earn a living. There's so much to be thankful for, so much that you've entrusted us with, Lord. But uh, beyond that, now the idea of the mysteries of God. We've been initiated into something. There's a lot of people that don't know the gospel. 
they don't know that we're saved by grace alone. Uh, they don't really know what the future is, what's going to happen in the future, but we, you've entrusted all these wonderful truths to us through your word. Lord, help us to be good managers, household managers, and with the attitude of a servant, an under rower, Lord, as we move through this life on your behalf, sharing what you've given us with those around us for your glory. And we ask this in Jesus' name, amen.